Good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us this session. Uh, this morning, we're going to be addressing urban growth through city planning. And um, we are we're fortunate this morning to have a, a truly distinguished panel uh, before us. I'm going to introduce each of our speakers, uh, and then each of them will be presenting. After that, we'll follow it up with uh, question and answers. Just again, a reminder to use the ask and vote uh, op uh, option through either the website or the app. And uh, remember to also vote on other people's questions. We will not have time to answer them all, I'm sure. Uh, so voting on somebody else's question will rise it up the list. Um, so first of all, this morning, uh, we are fortunate to be uh, joined by Mr. Gaetan Su. Uh, Gaetan is the former chairperson at the State Land Development Company. Gaetan continues his mission to influence sustainable cities as the past president of the International Union of Architects and former board director of Future Cities UK and chairman of Construction Industry Board of Mauritius. We are also joined by um, Mr. Stefan Webb. Stefan leads the design, development, and delivery of projects across the Future Cities catapult. Stefan has worked with Greater Manchester to create a new way to understand infrastructure capacity, develop the case for data de devolution to Bristol, and led a review of the Smart Dubai strategy. Uh, we also have Ms. Suzanne Settinger. As a global sub-segment manager for open spaces and professional systems at Philips Lighting, Suzanne leads the strategy on how connected LED lighting creates safe, inviting, and responsive urban environments. Her background spans architecture, urban planning, and human-computer interaction. Finally, our last speaker this morning will be Mr. Alexei Novikov. Alexei is an entrepreneur and urban scientist with a PhD in regional and urban studies. Alexei is founder and president of the urban data platform Habitatum. He was previously a managing director at Standard & Poor's and at, the, at Thomson Reuters. He has also consulted for the World Bank on infrastructure finance. Now, before we get started, uh, Javier, if you don't mind bringing up the lights just a little bit for us and uh, why he does that, please join me in thanking Javier and all of our volunteers here who have made this morning and all of our sessions possible. <laughs> so before we get started, we wanna, we've introduced all of our speakers. We want to get to know you a little bit. So just by clapping, we're going to do this by sectors. How many of you are here representing the public sector? And the private sector? Fairly balanced. Anybody from academia? And any other in the, uh, sectors not yet mentioned? Oh, we got everybody. All right, well listen, thank you very much. Um, this session today, uh, as I said, is, is looking at the growth of our cities. The United Nations has done a study that says three million people around the world every single week are moving into our urban centers. Um, this, this is providing great challenges and opportunities for our cities. Among the, the both challenges and opportunities uh, includes the access to information. We are in the information age. The question is, how will our cities use the data it has access to? How will it collect that data? How will it process it? How can we take advantage of real-time processing? Um, how do we truly make the unseen visible? So to, get, to get us started, we're, we're going to have Mr. Gaetan join us this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning. I come from this small island, Mauritius, lost in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Is it a city? Is it a town? Is it an island? Is it a country? 1.3 million people total. It's both an island and a city. No natural resources, zero budget to boost the city. So we had to use mainly innovation, and innovation in terms of finance, in terms of legal framework, and also, of, of course, uh, um, IT. With this, sir. 
And what we've got in Mauritius, however, are, is our people. Our people come from three continents, 10 religions, 13 languages from all over the world. And, and uh, it's a small world in miniature. We've got all, all uh, that's why one of the, the ideas we want to promote is to use culture as a driver and how to connect culture to IT and to the city. Why culture? When you see the first picture, Sydney Opera House, no need to explain where it comes from and why it's there. It put Australia on the world map. The second one, Bilbao, in one year, a single building, again a cultural building, has changed the city so much, 20% 20, 20 of tourism growth in one single year. And Bilbao was suddenly on the world map. West Kowloon in Hong Kong, 40 hectares of reclaimed land over the sea, doing 17 different cultural projects. The first one is being in construction now, the, the Chinese Opera House. Second one, uh, and on the way, uh, museum of 21st century. And all this is driven by the idea behind that culture and creative industries and cultural industries can be a real driver for the economy. It's 2.25 trillion US dollars a year by uh, Ernst and Young uh, studies recently. And it's 29 million jobs all around the world. And Port Louis, our capital city, is the place where all these people from all the free, free continents meet, from Europe, from Asia, and from Africa. And we are at the gateway of Africa. We call uh, Mauritius Africa for beginners. If you want to go to Africa, come to Mauritius first, and then you learn from the, here to go there. And why, why do we want to, to promote this? We want to promote this because Cities nowadays in the world compete. They compete among themselves. Sometimes cities in the same country compete, Beijing and Shanghai, Melbourne and Sydney, uh, Munich and Hamburg. They all compete to do what? To attract talent, to attract investment from the whole world. And to do so, and we've noticed that they are people are attracted, investors are attracted because they they are attracted to, with two things. One, the quality of life, the quality of infrastructure, and also the diversity of the, of, of the place. Uh, the, the deputy mayor just spoke earlier about the diversity of London, how, how uh, the, the population is so diverse. And diversity brings creativity, innovation, and link with IT and culture. It can bring a lot of things to the city. And IT allows not only the dialogue between all the people to create this, this uh, permanent uh, uh, development of new ideas, but IT also, which our future speak, uh, next speakers will speak more about, brings people and, and, and allows city management at a different level, at, uh, where you can manage the, the energy, the waste, and water in, in such a, an efficient way that has never been done before. And finally, our idea behind is to use the small island, because the island is only 1.3 million, as a platform, almost as a laboratory of ideas, a laboratory where we will develop all these creative and, and, and cultural industries as a platform to con to then export to the African continent, export through the online economy, which again with IT is possible and which was not possible before. The second idea we want to, to develop in, with IT in, in Mauritius is most of the city management application or innovation has been developed for the north, the global north, that is in terms of energy saving, in terms of our water management and, and traffic flows for the north. And very little has been done for tropical countries. And Mauritius in, is one of these tropical countries. By the way, did you know that out of the 200 countries in the world, 110 countries are from the tropical climate area? 
So this is a very good market and we would like to be the platform where this would be developed to, to go to Africa. So I will end here and to say that all this is done with only one resource, our people. And this is what is a city, but the people. I didn't say it, Shakespeare said that 400 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Stefan Webb. I'm uh, our head of projects at uh, Future Cities Catapult. Uh, but I've got the wrong slides. Yep. <laughs> I think we have the wrong. It's uh, Stefan. We look quite similar. I think. <laughs> Um, so uh, the Future Cities Catapult is a, a technology and innovation centre uh, set up by UK government uh, and our mission is to uh, advance urban innovation uh, to grow UK companies but critically to, to make cities better um, and we do that by bringing together and working with uh, academics, uh, business, uh, uh, public sector uh, and critically citizens as well. Uh, and one of the areas that we've identified as a priority is uh, integrated uh, urban planning. Uh, but within that is the, the land use planning process, the, the process by which a city decides uh, what development should happen where, when and, and, and how. Um, and in part that's because planners, of which I used to be one, uh, are a much maligned uh, species. They're blamed uh, by developers, they're blamed by architects, they're blamed by politicians, uh, but actually they don't necessarily have uh, the right tools uh, or the right support. Uh, to deliver the kind of job uh, that they'd like to. Um, so we've set up a, a future of planning uh, program where we're seeking to, to understand where there are opportunities um, for innovation. Um, so this is a picture and a, a, an example of the planning system uh, in the UK as it exists today. But broadly speaking, uh, most cities have a similar process for generating their land use plan. Uh, from the, your left, uh, they, they suck in data. Uh, uh, that data is interpreted uh, by consultants uh, to create an evidence base. And that evidence base can be population projections. It can be where there is demand for, for social infrastructure. It can be uh, developments around uh, where there is more or less uh, employment demand. Uh, and that evidence base is used to, to create a plan, to create policies uh, that prioritize certain types of development in certain ways. Uh, and it's that plan which uh, developers then submit applications to, to develop. Now, um, the, the, the key thing for me is that you'll notice that citizens are quite small uh, in that diagram uh, because planning is seen as quite technical. Uh, we don't, I don't think it's uh, particularly technical, but equally not enough is done to, to link citizens in uh, more. Uh, but equally, the key thing for me is uh, in the, the bottom left corner is that broken line, that broken line around data, where uh, whilst lots of data is some used uh, uh, for uh, the evidence base and to generate the plan, there's not really a feedback loop. Uh, and part of the challenge is uh, many of the systems used to drive planning are either deeply analog uh, or they're based on PDFs. Uh, and PDFs, uh, no use to man or beast when it comes to analyzing data. Um, so we believe that, that uh, a more uh, data-driven uh, and digitally enabled uh, planning system uh, will, should be put in place to free planners uh, to plan, to help them do the uh, uh, more qualitative blitz of planning because planning is a mix of, of science and, and art. Um, and why do we think they're important? As with many other industries, uh, they bring about transparency. They have the opportunity to, to show people what's going on, uh, potentially in real time, potentially in more engaging ways. So uh, most uh, uh, people now uh, use uh, smartphones, have digital tools uh, for most of their lives, to do most of their jobs in life, uh, but, but planning is, is not really a part of that yet. So we think uh, having more digital tools uh, can help people understand planning. But critically, planning is all about collaboration. So it's all about architects working with engineers, working with planners, working with citizens. Uh, but often they're bringing their own tools, their own uh, assumptions uh, to the table. Uh, and we think data and digital tools can help with that collaboration and, and reduce uh, uh, some friction. Uh, but critically, there's a lot of work that can be done by these tools uh, that planners don't want to do, that, that's uh, kind of low value and, and kind of quite friction uh, laden. Uh, and we think that, that more digital tools, tools can kind of accelerate that. 
Uh, now, here's, uh, this is a table uh, from a study by McKinsey that was produced, I think, six, nine months ago, uh, and looks at various sectors uh, with reference to their uh, product, or how digitized they are, and also looks at their productivity. Um, and you'll notice that construction is, is right down the bottom, only agriculture and hunting is less digital. I'm not quite sure how that is. Um, um, but that affects productivity. There's a, there's a, a linked productivity uh, which we think uh, can be improved. Uh, now, in terms of construction, in the, the bottom right there, you have a, a BIM model, building information model. Uh, so this is a, a, a standards-driven environment for, uh, in particular, architects and engineers to collaborate and design uh, a building. Uh, that will make uh, construction as a sector more efficient, but we need parallel improvements in uh, planning. Um, and I strongly believe that these building information models can and should be used to inform the city plan. Uh, at the top there you have uh, uh, DeepMind, uh, an example of machine learning where uh, these techniques can and should be applied to uh, the reams of data that are produced about a city to help uh, gather insight into, into a city plan. Uh, and then in the bottom left you have uh, an example of a video from uh, Magic Loop, uh, which is a mixed reality uh, company, uh, HoloLens or another one, uh, where we think there's great opportunity to engage citizens uh, and do uh, design, planning and architecture uh, more virtually. Um, and part of our drive to do this is if uh, cities don't start to think about how they plan in a more digital and efficient way, uh, someone else might do it for them. So mm. we've seen how many other industries uh, in the city have been disrupted by uh, people that you might not otherwise expect. Uh, we're aware that uh, sidewalk labs have, have been exploring how they might uh, design and build a city, uh, and that's great, uh, but also cities should be thinking about how they can digitally design, build and plan uh, their cities. Um, and one of the challenges and one of the, the areas that the Catapult is focusing strongly on is kind of supporting the innovation that's already happening. So uh, 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 digital innovation and planning historically haven't gone together. Uh, we have a few SMEs in the building that are starting to, to make uh, planning policies more searchable uh, and more spatially related. We have people that are, that are pulling together uh, land registry data so, uh, and, and other planning data sets, people that are experimenting with, with augmented reality uh, to show where development might be occurring in your neighborhood. Uh, but it's quite sparse at the moment uh, and uh, we want to seek to accelerate that. Uh, and, and what we also want to accelerate is experimentation. Uh, in most other sectors, experimentation is the only way you, you realize how to, how to do something new and different. Uh, and this is an example of an experiment that Future Cities Catapult did as part of a, an exhibition called Big Bang Data. Uh, this was at Somerset House in London, uh, and most of the other exhibits focused on uh, the, the joys or otherwise of uh, uh, the, the NSA uh, and other kind of issues relating to data security, but we wanted to do something fun. We wanted to engage citizens in data and data models. Uh, so we looked at all of the plans that there are about London, the London plan, uh, the water plan, uh, got all the appendices that no one ever reads. Uh, and we gave them to our data scientists and our software developers uh, to, to build a simple data model uh, and then to build an interface that would engage citizens uh, and ask them some of the questions that a mayor of any city might have to deal with and ask them questions about their behavior. Uh, and that behavior and the, the, the answers to their questions fed into uh, a simple uh, answer of the kind of London that their priorities and choices have led to. Uh, to me, this is a great example of how you can better connect citizens uh, with planning, uh, and we believe that the cities and others need to do more experiments in this kind of area. Uh, and also, critically, cities should draw on the experimenters in their midst. Uh, there are plenty of uh, uh, hackers, uh, uh, SMEs, and startups uh, that can produce stuff very quickly, very easily. So this uh, is from uh, uh, some hackers who've set up a little company called Design Space VR. Over two hackathons, one that was in our building, one that was, I think, in Helsinki, uh, they built this uh, uh, VR tool that enables you to drop the plan for a new development in. You can then walk through that development in virtual reality, uh, and what uh, the tool then does is pick up where you're walking and what you're looking at, which can be really useful information for amending the, the design of the scheme or, or, or particular uh, elements of the building. Uh, the, and these guys did it really cheaply. Uh, if you're a city and you talk to a larger company uh, and ask for this kind of service, they, there will be lots of zeros on the number. Uh, uh, these, these hackers did it in a weekend. They'd be very grateful for any money, no doubt. But it's a really great tool. It's really, really impressive. And, and cities need to draw on uh, the experimenters that, that are in their midst. Thank you. <clears throat>
I realize uh, several of you have joined us since we started, so uh, as Suzanne gets ready, uh, I'll just remind folks who have not already done so uh, to please start submitting your questions. Uh, our hostess is going to bring me a, an iPad shortly, um, so I'll have a sense of what questions you're asking. Suzanne. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those feedback loops that Stefan was mentioning before and how we can leverage infrastructure that's out there in the field to enable those feedback loops. And I timed myself, so I promise I won't go too long. So we'll see how this works. Um, the slides will just keep moving. Uh, one of the things I want to call your attention to is what kinds of armatures do we actually have at our disposal? One of the things that's really ubiquitous and that is increasingly focused on people and actually human needs is lighting. Uh, in the city of Los Angeles, for example, you have about 215,000 streetlights that are all over the place where people are. And what they're doing is they're outfitting every single streetlight with a cellular connected node that allows you to talk to that streetlight. So suddenly that node, that streetlight, is actually able to communicate with the cloud. Uh, and as a result, it's able to allow you to gather any kinds of additional information about what's going on in a particular location. And so as they're starting to do this, they're actually demonstrating how uh, infrastructure, those things that really are most of the time, you know, way down at the bottom of that, of that study that uh, Stefan was showing, they're dumb, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, filled with life, they're not talking or communicating. Suddenly, these kinds of things like this bus stop in Paris, this experimental bus stop, can be just as connected as we are as citizens as we're moving around cities. Now, one of the challenges, particularly when you start to think about different governmental silos or different departmental silos, is who wants to share their infrastructure? It's mine, right? So tell, talk to me about any one of you from the government sector. Um, you know, rarely do you have an incentive to really give up ownership over your particular vertical or your particular sort of um, uh, infrastructure, also because you're the expert in that. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to manage and maintain that infrastructure from a very particular point of view. However, there are situations when it makes sense to leverage, for whatever reason, one particular infrastructure for another purpose. And I think that's where some of these interesting overlaps start to occur that might lead to new kinds of opportunities, whether those are opportunities for deploying new sensors or for doing other kinds of analytics. And so what does that actually mean? What are the characteristics of the kinds of infrastructure that you need? Uh, and I put a somewhat facetiously up here this, this fun uh, project from Brooklyn, New York around signage. But you, know, you need this digital networked uh, scalable uh, materials, if you will, or infrastructure that will enable you to then leverage multiple, um, multiple capabilities. So, um, what we've been doing, and we've been experimenting with the Bureau of Street Lighting in Los Angeles to really understand what this might mean. So uh, the Bureau of Street Lighting, like I said, they've been already pushing the boundaries quite a bit. They're experimenting with new kinds of uh, control systems, remote man management systems. But they said, well, we want to actually do more. We want to sort of pull out this, this data that's out there. Um, and so what we've done with them is actually outfit it, and this is a pilot program, and I think we're all here in the spirit of, of experimentation and piloting because one of the things that we've learned is that we have to try these things. We have to put things out into the field and take them into the wild. It's not just about doing things in you know, our own laboratory spaces. And so what we've been doing with the city is, is actually experimenting with their street lighting infrastructure around a couple of different uh, elements. So I'll start with the more dry one because, uh, you know, it's also important. Um, one of the things that is really, uh, you know, actually challenging is for a city, and in this case in Los Angeles in particular, to manage their um, electrical grid, the electrical grid that is actually feeding the street lighting. Street lighting is a critical thing for them for safety, and they want to know when there are odd fluctuations in voltages or frequencies, because that frequencies, because that could mean that, for example, a street light not, might not be functioning. And for them, that's a critical thing that they're delivering to the citizens. So one of the things we've been looking at, and this is a cloud-based dashboard that the city can access uh, anytime, anywhere, that's looking at real-time uh, data about what's going on. 
Now, in addition, we're actually looking at the sound environment, the acoustic environment. And when we were getting ready before, we were talking about what our panel is about, and we were talking about making the invisible visible. And acoustic monitoring is one of those things that's truly invisible, right? I'm sure you guys are all aware of all the sounds around us here, but imagine a city. It's even more, uh, uh, you know, uh, crazy. So um, what we've been looking at is actually trying to understand all of the different aspects of the acoustic environment specifically in very dense increments. So not only is every light pole in this small district where our pilot is counting or, or looking at specific metrics, but we're also doing it every 15 seconds. So what that does is it gives you a granularity of information that is unprecedented. Because in the past, if you actually, you know, before construction projects, etc., will do point studies, right? Your experts will go out into the field. They'll do analyses out, uh, out there with very special equipment. But that activity is actually very expensive, and it only happens at a very particular moment. So, for example, if you have certain, um, um, you know, uh, regulations or, or, or policies in place, how do you know if people are actually adhering to those continuously? So, you know, and if you take that to even the next level and you're going beyond just simple thresholds or simple averages, going to this idea of a, of a real urban soundscape, then you're really even getting into more detail and we've been trying to look at additional metrics. So not just looking at the typical um, human hearing frequencies, but also looking at very high pitch frequencies, very low frequencies, those droning sounds that might be indicative of certain kinds of nuisances. And we've been actually looking at those. And so this is a snapshot of what one of our partners, uh, Dietmar Offenhuber from Northeastern University, has been visualizing uh, with this data. And um, what you can see is actually the, the light color is very noisy and the uh, darker blue is less noisy. So this main street here is most of the time quite loud. Uh, it's a little bit jumpy here, but happy to show anyone later as well. So what you see is that essentially the main street is particularly loud, so not surprisingly so. But these kinds of patterns are bringing out these invisible features that otherwise wouldn't be as accessible to architects, designers, who are making material choices, uh, you know, planting choices, etc. So let's look at some of those details. Uh, one of the things we saw, for example, with these deployed sensors is you could see that there was a truck that was idling for quite a while, actually, and sitting out on the street. And that had a big effect over the whole length of the street. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, if you have a policy in place that shipping and loading is only allowed during certain times of the day, then as a planning agency, you really want to know if someone's out there at a time when they were supposed to be. Um, that might enable new kinds of applications. Here you can see that the school that's right next door to some of these sensors, you know, registered <laughs> high-pitched sounds uh, with little kids uh, heading, heading on their way to, to school in the early morning. You can also see how foliage and plantings and material choices have a significant impact on what's actually going on in a, in a city environment. So the idea that you truly have to make these selections that are, you know, you don't even think about that they'll have an effect on this sort of soft aspect of space, um, that these things are actually are hugely important uh, part of the planning process. So, you know, looking, pulling together all of these things, who thought street lighting could be connected with some of these topics, right? But in fact, it, it can, and in fact, there are these overlaps between these different elements. And so, you know, I think one of the, I'll just close with this because it's such a striking image, but right, when back in the 60s we thought, you know, this would be the future, of course the reality is more something like this. Um, it is more challenging than we thought, but the more we collaborate, the more we work together on these intersections, uh, the more informed we will be as we make these very critical uh, decisions today and, and going forward. So, thanks very much. Hi everyone, um, it's very nice to be back to Barcelona. I represent a company called Heavy Datum. This is an American company built around the uh, platform that is um, 
tailored to work with uh, spontaneous data, data generated by citizens, their devices, and so we've done this deliberately to help um, urban planners and businesses uh, to navigate their activities and to actually make decisions. Uh, so uh, for us, um, the most important thing uh, dealing with the spontaneous data is time, because while this, uh, we are dealing with the streams of data, with uh, um, data that actually is pregnant with time, and so that's why we are, are playing with time every, uh, every time we uh, do any of our projects. So basically, uh, well, you see here, well, the, the diagram, the, the, the model, the, the main visualization pattern that we use in our platform. So where the vertical is time, it's three-dimensional image of the city where, well, you have a plan, uh, you have uh, uh, time slots, uh, and so you can actually uh, build the city as a process uh, across uh, the time um, uh, whatever it is, whatever it means. It could be hours, it could be days and uh, seasons, etc. Uh, et so, um, uh, for, well, we, for this session, I think, well, uh, the time uh, is very important uh, because uh, we are dealing now with uh, a completely uh, different uh, understanding of what uh, economic growth could be. Uh, for the global economy and for the for cities uh, and so we are dealing with a dramatic shift of the agenda uh, that uh, of economic growth that actually uh, put the growth uh, uh, on the background and on the first ground so we have uh, uh, economic capital uh, cities uh, environment urban environment etc so and it's more about uh, coordination, savings, uh, than anything else. So we are focused on uh, finding inefficiencies in the city tissue, in the urban tissue, so that's why we uh, are trying to uh, use the time as a potential to find some uh, uh, better uh, efficiencies, better um, uh, ways to uh, plan the city. So here you see, well, how we are dealing with the urban sprawl. So, well, this is the uh, map that's showing you uh, a commuter pattern. So, well, everything that is uh, around, uh, well, the development of this area, this is uh, one of the Russian cities, uh, uh, actually is uh, about the coordination of uh, uh, commuters uh, that represent 20% of uh, all um, mm, uh, activities uh, that are happening here. So, well, here you have the uneven distribution of uh, employment, uh, jobs actually in the American cities, and so also this is about uh, commuting and coordination. Uh, so finally, we, when we, we started thinking about uh, how we can uh, actually address this issue, the issue of coordination, uh, the issue of time in the city, so we came up with the idea of temporary societies. This term actually uh, comes from, uh, well, 1950s, it's the organizational theory, it, 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 it was meant to deal with uh, uh, temporary societies within big corporations, but I think that, well, uh, this kind of term actually uh, uh, works very well for uh, current uh, urban agenda. So you can have uh, an area where you have everybody and you can think about this area as very much cos cosmopolitan, but it's not true because, well, each of the um, uh, diasporas that is using this area it actually is using it at certain point of time and they may not even cross uh, so when you ask someone are you local here so well the question would be uh, back to you at what time uh, so this is one of our projects that we've done for London and, uh, and actually with, with the help of our interns in Habitatum uh, and uh, we found out that um, there is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, coexistence of diasporas that would never uh, be uh, together uh, for at least for a long time because they have different cultural values, like, for example, LGBT communities or Muslims, uh, a mu Muslim diaspora, etc. But they are in this particular area all the time, uh, not all the time, but actually they are there, but at a different time. So they use this area uh, at different time slots, and this is very interesting. So we are dealing with a kind of a time segregation 
instead of special segregation. Whether this is good or bad, we have to uh, answer, but uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, question, and so we are going to look at this um, uh, temporary societies in other cities as well. Uh, so then we started playing with uh, 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 various uh, economic concepts. So we actually decided to check if, uh, uh, well, the combination of high rental price, uh, high activity and low diversity in each particular of a big city um, is kind of a, can be explained and uh, uh, and uh, if, if this is a, a degradation process of a place when the uh, high uh, rental price actually squeezes out diversity and then you have a, a pretty much uh, uh, kind of rich uh, area in the city with uh, low uh, diversity and with the boring infrastructure around. Uh, so what, what has to be done with that? So we actually starting analyze uh, the stream of data and uh, mm, uh, in two cities, the, the city of London and then uh, New York. Uh, so here you see the combination of uh, areas with a high rental price and with um, uh, sentiments uh, that may be negative or positive and uh, it seems like while well, London uh, uh, then for example New York. In New York you see uh, a, a clear uh, picture of uh, those uh, places that uh, keep degradating as uh, mm, long as the price of uh, mm, commercial rent is going up. And um, we came up with a, an idea of commercial time sharing, actually trying to uh, stop this process by just offering uh, quasi public space, which is proprietary space in the ground floors, all and responsible for social infrastructure, and then they cannot afford the current uh, commercial rent, but they could have um, uh, afforded it once we uh, had these uh, ground floor spaces. Uh, proprietary spaces open for them. Uh, and this model actually uh, helps you to understand uh, well how, how it works. Uh, so we um, actually took only those areas with a high rental price. Um, uh, then um, we took areas with the low diversity and high activity, which was measured by taxi pickups. Uh, it's open data, but well, it's a stream of data. And so we can measure this. Um, uh, over time. So uh, basically uh, then um, well the idea came up to us so why don't we uh, actually try to create a kind of a sublease market uh, um, that um, can be ar arranged around our platform. So well you can actually pick up one of these uh, so-called uh, voxels and uh, so uh, and if it represents uh, a free time slot in any of the commercial buildings around, so why don't it, uh, we can sell it to someone who is interested in arranging their some well, bookstore or uh, a gallery or uh, provide some uh, services such as uh, uh, foreign language courses and all this kind of stuff. So well, why don't we break the walls of ground floors and, 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 and leave people uh, um, uh, and let people uh, actually uh, be there uh, and uh, will consume services, products, and uh, actually uh, allow small and medium-sized businesses to get this space at a lower uh, rent. So then the idea of um, a time zoning uh, actually came to our mind, and so why don't we actually try to do the same as we do with carbon market or with the uh, zoning regulations that uh, actually control heights of the building. So what if we sell time quarters uh, 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 to um, various businesses that would like actually uh, to have them? Um, so of course it will require some regulations. Uh, of course it will require some hours per square meter uh, metrics. Uh, the thresholds that has to be a, th a threshold that have to be uh, mm, actually arranged by the municipalities. Uh, so, well, we could create a time quarter market uh, for uh, ground floor areas of commercial buildings, and then mm, if, uh, 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 for example, 
a library or, or a museum or any social infrastructural uh, enterprise uh, uses its space more than eight hours a day, uh, so then they can sell the quarter to those who would like to stay, well, eight hours a day. So actually this is an additional source of financing for small and medium-sized businesses and social infrastructure. And it will definitely create a, a better coordination, uh, time coordination uh, uh, environment and try to decongest uh, areas that are normally uh, congested. So basically this is the new pricing model that we can build around our platform. So we can uh, actually create the new price for the ground floor uh, commercial uh, space that is open to the public of office hours, out of beyond office hours. And basically it's uh, nothing to do with the real rental price that, is, uh, that does exist in this area for commercial purposes. It's just the space maintenance cost for this particular time. Uh, plus some uh, margin that while well, the uh, building owner would like to keep. So um, basically this is only the beginning and we have to think about platform economics around time market and so we know that uh, for example the diners club was model was created uh, half a century ago probably with the same kind of attitude that well uh, uh, that uh, that people can have access to the restaurants and the restaurants have uh, had to have uh, access to people so why don't we do this uh, the same at the with a new level of uh, um, technology with a new sophistication uh, about the commercial space that is not used more than 60 uh, percent of time that uh, well it exists actually in the city so well why don't we use this potential thank you very much mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, now is time for your questions. Um, we do have a microphone here. If uh, any of you do have a question, please come up. We have a few submitted, uh, or a couple submitted, uh, using the app. So I'm going to start with the first. To all of our panelists, what are the most relevant environmental benefits of the projects you just presented? There are microphones on the table in front of you. So I, I can start. Um, I guess the the first one is the in the transition to LED uh, street lighting. There's an enormous um, carbon footprint reduction because of the energy savings that that presents. So shifting to newer infrastructures often brings with it certain specific um, benefits like that. So so that's a, a key one to point out. Um, in addition, the the idea around um, acoustic monitoring is that there's also a lot of interesting connections with traffic management potentially in the longer run. There's thoughts on how you can use that to, to understand traffic patterns better and thereby regulate them. It's not a direct link, but, but it's certainly linked to this idea of managing the urban environment more, um, more um, uh, holistically so that as a result you can create neighborhoods that are more appropriate for certain uses and link it up to those uh, land use decisions that, that Stefan was talking about. Uh, so yeah, for, I think from my perspective, the the, the better and use of data and, and digital tools to, to support collaboration is the one where you can get uh, the most environmental benefit. So so bad or less optimum, let's say, uh, planning decisions uh, can be very expensive uh, financially, economically, and, and socially. Uh, so the ability to, to better collaborate and coordinate to uh, design uh, and develop buildings in the right place uh, to be delivered at the right time should have uh, multiple uh, environmental benefits. Yeah, um, for us, the, the first result, which I didn't mention, we have used a software called Mapsioner, which is from Finland, to survey uh, what we propose to the population. And the, the immediate result we got is like 22% of the young population, that is between 20 and 35, are wishing to relocate in the city center, and which means less transport on the city, for, for this, this population, but of course, a little bit of pressure on the buildings to re uh, transform themselves into more residential space. But it's, it's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, uh, I think uh, well, our analysis shows that well, uh, m most of the built environment in our cities are not used uh, well, 50, 60 percent of time. Well, of course, this is a part be partly because of uh, uh, biorhythms, etc. But uh, even if you think about four extra hours, so well, you can actually uh, create a healthier environment, a healthier density, and you can prevent the urban sprawl, and you can prevent actually the inefficient use of space. Uh, uh, so by uh, analyzing the time, you actually uh, get more resources, special resources. Time is additional space for the city, actually. It's a little bit uh, kind of um, a joke, but this uh, it, it definitely is. <laughs> Thank you. Sir, tell us your name and, and give us your question. Uh, my name is David Klingberg. I work for a company called David Lock Associates. We're town planners and urban designers. We're, um, we have an office in Australia, and we are um, just completing our first smart city strategy for a city called Newcastle in New mm -hmm. South Wales. And a question I have for Stefan, I think really is, um, directed to Stefan really, is um, one of the challenges I'm finding, or we're finding with writing the strategy, is the inundation of uh, applications and trying to document those and sift through what are the most relevant ones right here, right now for the city of Newcastle. I was just wondering if you've got any insights into how, how to make the right choices. Um, I think partly, I think as I mentioned, I, I have a huge frustration with, with PDF. So, so all UK planning applications, uh, there's a planning portal where you put in all of this data. Uh, and, and it spews out a PDF that, that's no use to man or beast. Now, uh, what we, we've done one little experiment uh, with a, a data crawler and giving it a tiny little bit of machine learning to say, well, pick out uh, applications of this type, so this size, whether they're office, residential, or whatever. Um, uh, and that helps a little bit because then that becomes data that you can analyze. So we use that to understand where smaller applications uh, were creating a strategic impact. Uh, so there wasn't a transport impact assessment about them. So, uh, uh, But I think the systems need to change. So yes, you can uh, uh, try machine learning or different kind of techniques, uh, but more fundamentally, the way in which uh, cities accept and interpret the data that is in a planning application uh, 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 needs to change quite, quite. I'd say quite significantly from what it is now, but in the scheme of things, it's just standardizing it a bit more, uh, asking uh, and ensuring that, uh, for example, where there are bigger developments that are where the architects will be doing building information models, uh, that, that you ask for those kinds of things. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, there's an awful lot of human time spent sifting through to understand what is significant and significant on one development uh, it, it might be environmental it might environmentally significant might be significant might be a, a completely different factor and we don't really have uh, the tools to do it and it's not a good use of planners time creativity and skill kind of doing that sifting good. thank you Another question from uh, online. What are the examples of the best practices in city planning? It's not quite an easy one, I guess. <laughs> What's that? It is. So we, I'll, I'll, I'll have to start first. We've just uh, commissioned, almost completed uh, a state-of-the-art uh, piece of research uh, in terms of city planning, UK and, and globally. Um, and it's a mixed picture. Um, places like, for example, Singapore are already using building information models to inform their city plans. Um, uh, there's good examples in Montreal uh, of using kind of gaming techniques of sorts to, to engage citizens, and now they're going quite strongly uh, in terms of uh, virtual reality. Um, in the UK, actually, there's a, a smallish city called Plymouth uh, who uh, are doing a great deal to. Uh, demystify planning to a certain extent to, to, to engage citizens a lot more. So there's there's kind of sporadic examples uh, that I've seen, but no uh, one city that's got the whole package. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe just to add on, on to that, um, we did a, a project together with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and they surveyed uh, 12 uh, citizens in 12 cities around the world and asked them what they thought a smart city project is. And many of them didn't really have, you know, they thought they wanted more of them, but they weren't necessarily sure what they are. So one of the things that, that came out of that work was um, the idea of more 
tools for communication. And um, in the US, a, a big um, a program called Envision America that started as Envision Charlotte um, uh, has really caught on uh, significantly. And I think it is because they've done a very good job around the communications uh, of or and the communication aspect in general. What is the purpose? Why are we doing this? How does this relate to you? Why does this matter? What domains does this touch on? Why is this not just some mega tech project? And, and all of those things really uh, generated uh, enough excitement and buy-in that it also sort of st uh, you know, lasted throughout the length of the implementation. Because of course, one of the challenges with planning projects is they take too long. So by the time you've done all this great participatory work in the beginning, then you start your project, it takes however long it takes, and then by the end, all the stakeholders you had have gone off to do other things, so they're not there anymore to be your advocates with the community. So how do you create that linkage over the long course of, a, of an implementation? And I think uh, more examples like that, and, and some of the work that the Envision America team is sort of exchanging ideas around, I, I think is really helpful in that, in that way. Um, well, we, ha we have um, been seeing a lot of uh, good practices around the world and actually, well, B Barcelona is one of the best. Uh, and um, uh, with regards to time, I guess uh, one of the projects that we've done in Barcelona was about uh, well, uh, tourists and how they use this space. Uh, and the Barcelona Tourist Department was very much concerned about uh, the overloaded uh, uh, streets, especially in the center, and so we found out using Twitter information and using social network streams that uh, actually this is about two streets, La Rambla, the, the mm -hmm. Gothic Quarter, and the Paseig de la Gracia. And this is the only, this is all the problem. <laughs> and then if you play with time coordination, if you um, allow museums uh, open their doors uh, to public until midnight and even mm, uh, more so, then you actually, through the co time coordination activities, you can actually uh, mm, decrease the um, sensitivity of this problem. Uh, Italian cities like Tur Torino, Milan, and uh, some other cities, they actually use time uh, appendix to master plan. They actually uh, think about coordination of activities within the city, not necessarily with the big data uh, applications, but the more they go forward, the more they think about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I will speak for, for the emerging world and in the developing countries in Africa, how um, new technology and th this new way of thinking is revolutioning, uh, revolutionizing, did yeah. you say something like this? Uh, <laughs> the it. whole way of, of doing city planning. The use of space and time is totally different mm -hmm. now because it enables all these cities to manage their city assets in a totally different way, optimizing everything. So differing the time of investment in hard infrastructure and reusing, like uh, Alexei was saying, reusing empty space, reusing empty slots of time for the same infrastructure in a different way. And in Africa, this is really uh, essential. Uh, one example also of, 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 of uh, uh, circular economy, if I may say, because the, 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 the use of everything is changing. We're doing a project in Benin, in, in the capital city, where the waste management is stood, they don't have money to collect waste. So we're using the waste as money hmm. to be recycled, to, to be transformed into, into building materials, to build houses, and to employ the people that will need these houses in the, in the, in the, in the whole city. So it's, it's from waste to houses, and jobs and employment and everything. It's, the, it's, it's totally changing the way we look at things. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually have a question for all of you. Um, building off of this point, um, with access to new technologies, all of this information, as you said, adding the, the for instance, the time dimension to, to city planning, what, what a new or additional skills do city planners need to process all of this? So, uh, what, I think it's not just city planners, actually, it's, it's yeah. that often, the other decision makers as well. So, so mm -hmm. um, uh, the city planners are the ones that need to try and coordinate a number of different cogs, let's say, uh, but often it's the, the political uh, leaders that need digital leadership skills as well. They need to know 
um, the art of the possible. Uh, we're working with the Royal Town Planning Institute in the UK um, to, to help build a, what uh, the course is or what the things that they should be studying. And, and as a kind of town planner, you know, I think actually it should be essential for most town planners to have uh, a strong grounding in data science. Uh, uh, they, they, they'll have con strong groundings in statistics, but uh, I think increasingly they will need to uh, uh, learn more complex uh, data science methods uh, because that's the only way that they'll be able to intelligently client, as it were, uh, a lot of the new opportunities that are out there. Mm -hmm. I think some of it has to do with learning more about okay. um, prototyping skills. I think you know in the tech world we work a lot more with the ability to try things and to build prototypes and to actually test them out. I think planners we we think a long time then we implement, right? We we think a long time and we implement. And and I think speeding up those loops is something that is really um, needs to be become more comfortable for for city planners. I think I think also um, we should stop thinking into silos, mm -hmm. and 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 the use of data allows us because before we used to think uh, transport is one problem and therefore one solution, energy is one problem, one solution, and now it's all totally interconnected, and data, open data, also mm -hmm. uh, help us to think differently. Um, uh, the more we work with uh, data, with big data, the more we understand that actual, um, uh, well, the urban planning education, urban planning uh, agenda uh, is more important because, well, you, you have to, to be an uh, urbanist, you have to know uh, the city very well, even if you work with the big data, even if you work with uh, some sophisticated technology. So while the core understanding of the city is still very high in the... Uh, in the list. Uh, however, well, uh, seeing uh, um, uh, well, the mix of uh, professional mix of our company, so I should say that well, we are built out of uh, architects, uh, urban planners, IT designers, and uh, um, IT uh, specialists. So well, this is a kind of a right combination for the future urban planner and manager. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Knowing that uh, I'm the last thing that's separating you from lunch, uh, the summary I'm going to provide this morning will be brief, but let me just say, as, as the president and CEO of um, an international organization called Leading Cities, we work with cities in, in 10 different countries, and we exchange best practices and solutions for smarter cities. Um, what has emerged in our work, and I think we've heard from our panelists this morning, is that uh, technology is just a vehicle. Uh, it's providing greater access to data, for instance, more information, information which can be um, used and analyzed, processed, to create better cities. Um, but we cannot forget the human side of things. And, uh, as we all know, the, the theme of, of this Smart Cities World uh, Expo and World Congress is um, cities for citizens and citizens changing cities. The more we include our citizens in the decision-making process, the more we create those feedback loops that we've talked about this morning, uh, and the more we use technology to make that possible, the better all of our cities will be. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists this morning, uh, and thank you for joining us today.